three models of democracy. We talked about participatory democracy. How many people are participating in participatory democracy? A lot or very little? A lot. It's very broad participation. A lot of decisions are left up to who? Citizens. Uh, to the citizens, up to the people. The people have a lot of influence over the policy that government gets made, that government picks. What's the problem with it? Yeah, that giving us that decision, we may not have the what? No. We may not have the expertise, we may not have the knowledge to be able to make those correct decisions. The next one, pluralist theory or a pluralist model. Groups. We're all participating, we're all participating, but we're participating as what? Groups. As groups. We're all trying to influence the government, we're all competing against each other. The good thing is, hopefully none of, those, none of us become too powerful, no group becomes too powerful. And at the end, government makes policy that reflects the will of the people. What's the problem with it? When the groups get too what? Powerful. When they get too powerful. What do we call that? Hyperpluralism. Hyper pluralism on steroids. Hyperpluralism. In hyperpluralism, the government is being influenced by very powerful groups. So two things can happen. What, ha what can happen? The government doesn't, doesn't make any policy. Or contradictory and unnecessary policies get made. Oh, by the way, when government doesn't do anything, is unable to make policy because it's frozen by its inability to try to offend these, pe these groups. What do we call that? So let's put a G. We didn't talk about it yesterday, but we need to know it. Gridlock. Go ahead and put a, an arrow on no policy. It's gridlock. <coughs> and then hyperpluralism. An example. So where it says no policy gets made or something like that, just put an arrow and just put gridlock. Move on to our last model. Believe it or not, some of our founding fathers prefer this model. Some of you might love this person, but this is what he preferred America to be. It's called elite democracy. In elite democracy, while pluralism and um, participatory democracy allows a lot of people to be able to participate and make decisions when it comes to making policy. People that believe in this theory says, you know what, we have to narrow that down. We can't let everybody participate. We can't, only chosen few should be able to make decisions when it comes to governing, should be able to make policy. The few that hopefully have what? Expertise, no, expertise to be able to execute, to be able to make those decisions. Alexander Hamilton, as we're going to learn in this class, is a big proponent of this. He doesn't believe that we should give too much power to the masses, that we should reserve it for a select few. Those that actually know what they're talking about. So, political party of power rests with a few. And usually, like somebody here says, usually it's the people who are wealthy and educated, what we know as the elite. That's why this is called the elite theory. We should reserve it for only a few people who know what they're talking about, that can make the correct decisions. We can't have mob rule in the United States. Do you know? Do you know? Okay. Any one of these, man. Political participation is narrow, it's limited. Why? To make sure good decisions are being made by qualified people. To make sure that good decisions are being made by qualified people. Believe it or not, there are some semblance of elite democracy in our constitution. We like to talk about this country as the land of the free, the home of the brave. But for the most part, in the original constitution, or the way the founding fathers intended it to be, we're kept out of the loop for the most part. We'll talk about that later on. Um, the Electoral College, those of you that have studied the Electoral College will study more in depth later on. But the Electoral College is all about this. The power to choose the President of the United States doesn't rest with you originally. It rests with these few elite people called the Electoral College. They're the ones that chose the President of the United States. 
because some of the people, when they were making the Constitution, some of our founding fathers, they believed in the elite democracy theory. So what's the criticism of this? It's not voicing the opinion of It's not going to be voicing the opinion of the whole country. It's going to be voicing the opinion of a few. And usually those few are what? The elite, the, elite, the wealthy um, people of the United States. So in the graph that I gave you all, this is still evident today in the United States. This is Congress. In Congress, 50% 50 50 of the people that make up Congress are millionaires. In the actual population of the United States, only 1% of us are actually millionaires. So is Congress representative of the entire population of the United States? So when they're making policy, who are they usually going to benefit? The wealthy. The wealthy. So the criticism is policies only benefits the elite. Or in this our, in our particular case, it would be the wealthy elite class of the United States. Anybody have any questions before we move on? Next is political culture. Political culture, you're going to remember this because this is always on AP exams for some reason, is America's shared, you know what, better, commonly shared beliefs and values about government and how it should work about government, how it should run. So in the United States, we've ingrained some values within our culture, within our society, that most of us have, and, when government, when, and we want government to function the same way. So we'll talk about some of these. These are not all of the political culture values that we have. Number one, we value liberty. We value freedom. So that's simple. Most everybody would agree that freedom is a good thing. The more freedom you have, the better. We value equality, especially after the 1960s. This value has been incorporated into our political culture. If you say something against equality or equality of opportunity, you're going against the grain. That's something that we consider un-American if you do not believe in equality. So equality, what I mean by equality is equality of opportunity. And this is very, this is very um, important. It's not economic equality. That's not a value that we commonly share as Americans. Economic equality is not it. Because what is economic equality? Everybody gets, the same. Everybody gets the same reward at the end, and it's what? Why don't we believe in that? Because some jobs are harder. Some jobs are harder. Why don't we believe in that? What does that sound like? Communism. It's communism. And we've had a history with the Soviets during the Cold War, and that's something that most Americans will stay away from. It doesn't make you un-American to believe opposite of these things. You can be a communist and be an American, but you should know that these are the values most Americans do have and they do share. All right, individual responsibility. I'm responsible for myself. The government is not responsible for me. We're not responsible for each other. Because again, what's the opposite of that? What's the opposite of that? It's the opposite of an individual. Group. Group responsibility is the opposite of that. And that, again, that's similar to communism. That's why we try to stay away from that. While other European countries, this is something, a group responsibility is a value that they have. We are responsible for each other. If one of us falls down, is it is our responsibility to pick that one person up. But in the United States, that is kind of a dirty word for a lot of people. 
because again, we have a history with communism and stuff like that. Next, laissez-faire economics or capitalism. Economy free from government intervention. When you go to your economics class, you're going to talk about that more in depth. And we believe in civic duty, serving the country. All right, so why are we learning this? Why are we learning these values? Why do they matter? Um, oh, by the way, I myself don't agree with some of these. And you may not also. It doesn't make you un-American. It's just makes you different from most Americans. It's because these values, believe it or not, they affect you today. Most of the industrialized countries in the world, they have some form of universal health care. People that have the same wealth as we do, like Britain and Germany and Japan, those countries that are doing well, like us, they have universal health care. How come we don't have universal health care? How come our government doesn't take care of you when you get sick? Because you're responsible for yourself. That's a value that's within all of us. We also believe in laissez-faire economics, where the government should stay out of the should stay out of the economy. Where are you guys from? Um, we have orientation. Oh. It's exactly. Oh, okay. So, political culture shapes policy sometimes. Political culture shapes policy. All right, we're gonna move on to your, your next one. Are you missing one, sir? Yes. Pass it to him, please. Thank you so much. All right, I need you to take out a sheet of paper for me, please. Or if you have some blank space on your notes, that's fine also. Let's do this quickly. disagreements about how this island should work. So we divide the island and two groups get formed. This part of the island is called freedom land and that part of the island is called government land. In this part of the island there are no rules, there's no laws, no government that you have to obey. You can do whatever you want in freedom land. Over here is government land. In government land, every single facet of your life is controlled by some authority. From when you wake up, what time you go to sleep, what are you going to wear. Every single facet of your life is controlled. What kind of job are you going to have? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about where would you want to live. There's no right or wrong answer. I want you to think about where you want to live and why. I'll give you about three minutes to write down three cents. Where do you want to live and why? Do you want to live in freedom land? where there are no rules or regulations, or do you want to live in government land where everything is dictated for you? You don't have to draw the circle. <laughs> but you can put it inside the circle if you want. I don't care. 
Freedom land or government land? There's not an obvious right or wrong answer. There isn't a right or wrong answer. Also, don't give me that BS, I'm going to live in the middle. No. Mm -hmm. Take a stand. It's about three sentences, guys. So when I say three minutes, that actually means two minutes. Try to hurt. But right, I'll give you a minute more. Now. All right. If you chose government land, sit on this side. You don't have to bring your stuff. You can bring your, your things to, to guide you with the discussion. If you chose freedom land, sit on this side for me. If there's no chair, just stand in the back. Tell me why you would choose this place. Yes, ma'am. Um, I would love a government line because like, there's actual structure and order. So if you get killed, per se, someone would actually care. The structure and order that you may not have over here. Anybody here want to tell me why you want to live in Freedom Land? Freedom. <laughs> I prefer to live in Freedom Land because I'd be self-reliant on myself, which closely represents America. So I would be able to go back and feel like I was at home. You're relying on yourself. Okay. And it's close to America, I mean, even though not really. <laughs> Anybody from government land? It gives you like a sense of safety. A sense of safety? There's protection that you may not have in the freedom land? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else from freedom land? Protect yourself though. You can protect yourself in freedom land. No, but like, you still have the same protection you would here in our area. No. Yes, no. Really? no. Cops. Okay, so we're on an island with no material. Or what are the cops? Sorry? If we live in government land, are we like taking care of ourselves Are you saying that they're, they're the same thing? Yeah, I'm what not saying mean? it's the same thing. I'm just saying, like, he's saying, like, I, w I want other people to think, like, help me with, like, when I'm taking down, like, so then, like, uh -huh. like, you have responsibility here for yourself, like, in America. And then the same thing, you have your responsibility here in Freedom Land, too. Well, like, you, you can choose to have responsibility. You can like, choose not to, right? You have all the choices in the world. Yeah. Like, if you get pregnant, you can choose not to take care of that baby because there's no... No government that would force you to do that. There's something missing here that they have. Um, your life is safer, correct? You're probably going to live longer lives because this is living here is dangerous. It's a gamble every single day. But what do they have that you don't? I know what it is. That's what a C. It has choices. 
They can choose. They don't. They tell you. They Every tell you single facet of your life is controlled by a government. So you can reason. People over here can reason that. Sure, your life might be longer, but is it really life without choices? And that's what you have in government land. Go back to your seats, please. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so obviously the correct answer is not freedom land or government land, it's something in between. But the point of this class is, this is an age-old argument. How much government is too much? How much freedom is too much? Um, if you're a liberal, who are you leaning towards? Government. Government land. Because you think government can do a lot of good things, that you think government can help people out. If you're a conservative, where are you leaning? You're leading towards freedom land. You want government out of the picture as much as possible. This is still a debate today. How much government is too much? Because what you do have in freedom in government land is safety. You get protection. But what you but what freedom land offers you is choice. So we get dilemmas like um, torturing people for information to keep us safe. Do we violate somebody's freedom to be able to do that? Uh, wiretapping people's houses to keep people safe. We get dilemmas like that when we talk about how much freedom is too much or how much government is too much. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to rewind 400 years ago, 1600, before America even existed, There was a movement, a philosophical movement in Europe, in France, and in Great Britain that's going to change the world forever. That's going to change the way we look at things forever. It's called the Enlightenment. What does it mean to be enlightened? Realize more. Realize more, epiphanies. This is a philosophical movement, not just in politics, but in military, economy. Let's talk about what it was like before the Enlightenment. Before the Enlightenment, we lived in a, Europe was under the period of time called the Dark Ages. During the Dark Ages, very different from what we have today, most countries had what we call a monarchy. And most countries believe in archaic ideals, like for example, they believe in a hierarchy. They looked at nature, and then they tried to apply nature to what humanity is. People were very religious. So in nature, who's the top dog? Who's in the very top? Royalty. Nature. Who's in the very top? Zion. Remember that you are very religious. Who's in the very top? God. God is at the very top. Below him are the angels. Below him are human beings. Below the human beings are animals. And we try to apply that into human society. So we translated that. In human society, royalty, kings are at the very top. And then you get nobles, and then you get the people that work for the church, and then uh, the, all the way down you get peasants. And for a lot of people, this just made sense. And people back then believed in something called the divine rights of kings. That when a king comes to power, who put, them, who put him there? God did. God wanted you to have that power. God wanted you to be king. You were born a king because God wanted you to be that way. You were born a peasant because God wanted you to be a peasant. You were born a noble because God wanted you to be a noble. Everything was determined by God. And it was very difficult to overthrow a, a malevolent king because going against your king is going against who? God. It's going against your God. The Enlightenment is going to change all that. It's going to topple that hierarchy of being. And it's going to say, nobody was born a king and no one was born a slave. This is not the way it's supposed to be. So, let's fill this out. The divide of most countries in Europe back then were monarchies. The divine rights of king means that God put kings in power. 
power of the kings comes from God himself. But then in the 1600s, we get people like Rousseau and Voltaire and John Locke, and they use reason and apply it to government. And they, the ideas that we're going to talk about today from the Enlightenment may seem very mild for you guys, but for back, back then, this is treason. These ideas that we're going to talk about can get you hanged because you're questioning the way things were. And these ideas that they wrote down in their books and in their essays are going to cause wars, are going to burn entire cities to the ground. But that's what it took to have what we have now. Our founding fathers, these are the people that they study. These are the people whose ideas they're going to borrow and they're going to put in our founding documents, like the Declaration of Independence, like the Constitution of the United States. They're going to borrow these ideas from the Enlightenment and apply it to what we have now. So the first guy we're going to talk about, an English philosopher named Thomas Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes. I don't have a picture for him for you, I'm sorry. Thomas Hobbes. Um, theorize that before all of this, before governments, towns, civilization, humanity existed in the state of nature. In the state of nature, there were no rules, there were no authority. State of nature is like what? It's freedom land. No rules, no laws. There's nothing that's going to keep you from doing anything that you want. You have complete choice. You have all the rights that you can, you can want, like the right to be alive, the right to property, the right to move wherever you want to move. You have all those rights. That sounds like a good thing, right? But like some of you have already figured out, life in the state of nature wasn't good according to Thomas Hobbes. We are greedy as a species, we are naturally greedy. We are self-interested. And if you give us choices, we're going to eat each other alive. Because in freedom land, in the state of nature, not only do you have all these good rights, but you also have the right to do what? You have the right to murder. You have the right to rape. You have the right to rob somebody. Nobody's going to tell you otherwise. You have all the rights that you want. So, the right to kill is also here. The right to steal is also here. Even though we had all the freedom that we wanted, life in the state of nature was miserable and, and short because people would just kill each other. Without a government telling us what to do, that's what Thomas Hobbes said is going to happen because we are bad people. We are naturally evil. We are naturally self-interested. I need you to remember that because our founding fathers are going to think the same way. We are self-interested. We are evil by nature. That's what we are. And if you allow us to have all the freedom that we want, we will kill each other. The only thing stopping me from murdering her is that we have laws and we have a government that would stop me from doing that. So. For Thomas Hobbes, we, we used to live in the state of nature, a condition without government, laws, or authority. Humanity used to exist in the state of nature. We didn't have to follow anyone. However, life in the state of nature was short and miserable. So what did we do? Humanity used to live in the state of nature where we could do whatever we wanted but our lives were miserable and it was short because there was a lot of conflict, so what did we end up doing? What did we end up doing? We ended up coming into agreement, making a government. 
where people ended up saying, you know what? I'm going to give up some of my freedom. I'm going to give up this. If you promise, you, you will give it up also. And who's going to enforce that agreement? Who's going to make sure that you follow that agreement? The government. the government. That's why government exists. Government exists to protect us, to make sure that we're alive, to make sure that we can sleep at night. So this is called the social contract theory. People out of the state of nature came together and made an agreement that we're going to give up some of our rights, some of the freedoms that we used to have in the state of nature, and in return, we're going to have a government that will protect us. So this is called a social contract theory. An agreement between people and government. People will surrender some of their freedoms. In exchange, government will protect them. Hobbes goes on further and says this government has to be powerful. To be able to enforce this agreement, the government has to be strong. It's not going to be pretty. People are not going to like it sometimes. He calls it, and this is what he calls his book, the Leviathan. Anybody know what a Leviathan is? The sea moss. It's not supposed to be pretty. Government is bad. Government is big. But it's what? It's necessary. So what Thomas Hobbes is saying is, surrender your freedoms to the Leviathan, the Leviathan will protect you. Be afraid of the Leviathan, but it's necessary because the Leviathan will protect your life. To make sure that we can sleep at night knowing that nobody's going to hurt us, that there's going to be consequences if they do, we had to surrender the freedoms that we used to have and we gave it to the Leviathan. We gave it to a government. We gave it to a human civilization. So now we have rules. Now we have laws. We don't have complete freedom anymore. But at least we're still what? Alive. alive. We're not completely free anymore, but at least we're still alive. This is called the social contract theory. Hobbes argued for a powerful government that can enforce this contract. Star on social contract theory, you're gonna need to learn that. All right, next philosopher, turn your page, John Locke. John Locke is another philosopher. He also believed in the social contract theory, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But he's different from Thomas Hobbes, he's not in that he's not so pessimistic. So here's what John Locke says: When you were born.